Okay, and it is Monday, I guess, is it? Yep, January 25th. Finishing off chapter 17, so doing more examples of aromaticity. Um, we'll do a couple applications and maybe some fun stuff, I don't know. But homework two is due tonight. <laughs> some of you are already working on it, very good. Uh, quiz two isn't posted yet. It will be today sometime, uh, and it'll be due Thursday. We did grade homework one and quiz one. Maybe we're not finished, I don't know. Sometimes wait a few days. Don't don't email me and say, hey, I got a zero on my quiz. Why? Well, the answer is probably we haven't finished grading. <laughs> so yeah, let us finish that. I think we got a lot of them graded though. And then chapter 18, starting that, uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution. And that will be the last chapter uh, to get ready for what? Test one. So test one will be chapter 16 through 18 and electrophilic aromatic substitution. These are the reactions of benzene. There'll be five of them. So be reading ahead on that and be prepared for uh, Wednesday coming up on that. I think we want to go over to the board here um, and see what we've got a little review here of aromaticity. And, you know, why are we talking about this? Well, it's this extra stability that benzene and other aromatic compounds can have that makes them particularly stable and it changes how they react. They don't react the same way as simple alkenes. So we need to have a good understanding, a good definition of what aromaticity means and be able to use that criteria to determine if a compound is aromatic or not. And that will determine its reactivity along with its stability. So a couple different important factors. It's got to be flat, continuous, conjugated pi electrons. Okay, that kind of implies sp2 hybridization, right? P atomic orbitals all overlapping in a ring. It's got to be continuous, okay? And in a ring, uh, it's got to have 4n plus 2 pi electrons, according to the Huckel rule. <laughs> and n is any integer from 0 on up. So keep plugging in 0, and then 1, and then 2. And then you'll get this mathematical progression, 2, 6, 10, 14, 18, 22. And that's kind of a strange combination, isn't it? What's magical about that Huckel number of electrons? Well, we'll look at MO theory and the frost circles and hopefully figure that out. So it's really three conclusions here. If criteria one and two are met, we call it aromatic, as benzene is the typical one. If criteria two is not met, but it's still flat and continuous, whatever, we call that anti-aromatic. We saw that with cyclobutadiene last time, and we'll see some other examples. Uh, today. Uh, if criteria one is not met, and this is probably the most common category of organic compound, they're non-aromatic. Okay, so alkanes, simple alkenes, anything that's not continuous, not flat, okay, not fully conjugated, that would be non-aromatic. Okay, so let's look at some examples. I've got a couple uh, already written up here, and uh, let's see. Well, this one was from last time, cyclo Heptatriene, yeah, that's a, a methylene right there. <laughs> so what do we conclude here? Not aromatic, okay, so non-aromatic, right? But remember, we said if we could take off a hydride with its pair of electrons, we can get this cationic structure, right? It has a special name, tropillium cation. Uh, it's fully delocalized here. Even though it is charged, it has six pi electrons. So that's good, continuous, okay? Notice the criteria here says nothing about the number of atoms in the ring or their identity for that matter. They could be heteroatoms, oxygen or nitrogen. But uh, this fits the criteria. This is aromatic. This one is not, okay? What about cyclopentadiene, aromatic or not? A few people shaking their head. Others still not awake yet, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Why do you say it's not aromatic? Anybody help us out? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, again, similar to this one, we have an intervening uh, saturated carbon, right? Um, so, non-aromatic. If you looked at the proton NMR, it would be around 5 ppm. Ah, but can we make it so we have an ion of some kind that might be aromatic. Let's see. 
We've got how many pi electrons right now? One, two, three, four. We need to leave behind a pair here. So we're not going to treat it with a reagent that abstracts a hydride atom. We're going to do what? We're just going to treat it with base. <laughs> and believe it or not, potassium t-butoxide is a strong enough base to take a proton off here and leave behind that pair of electrons. So what is it now? It's cyclopentadienyl anion. CP anion, we sometimes abbreviate that. It's a very common compound. You can actually isolate this, put it in a bottle, okay? React it with other things, whatever. But this can come off easily with TB toxide. And that's kind of an amazing thing. You might say, well, it's allylic, right? These electrons are in resonance here with that. This position here, these hydrogens on the methylene are allylic, right? If we take off a proton, Leave behind the electrons, we've got some resonance there. Well, is that the only effect? Well, if we look at just simple propene, sorry, and you examine propene, yeah, you can say this methyl group next door to protein, propene, can you take off the protons there and get that same allylic type resonance? Well, the pKa there is 44. That's pretty high. It's not very acidic. But let's see if t-butoxide can take off a proton on cyclopentadiene. This pKa must be what? Lower or higher than the allylic proton? What do you say? Lower, okay. <laughs> and you can see why, hopefully. It's aromatic now. The uh, conjugate base, the anion that results here, is aromatic, six pi electrons, right? They're all delocalized. In fact, we can sometimes draw CP anion just like that. Okay. That means it's fully delocalized, right? The pKa here turns out to be 16. <laughs> that's amazing, right? And that's due to this aromaticity effect. Because look at the pKa of just an allylic proton. It's only 44. Okay, it's, it's, it's a little more acidic than a typical alkane. It does have conjugation resonance that way. But this has a special, what, aromatic resonance here, okay? So we do a different thing there. All right, what about, oh, let's go up here first. How about this guy, naphthalene? Remember we learned the name of that? <laughs> Is it cyclic? Yes, in fact, it's bicyclic. Aromatic compounds can be polycyclic. It doesn't have to be just one ring. Um, how many pi electrons total? Count them up. 10. Yeah. So is that the aromatic magic number? It sure is. It's bigger than benzene. Okay. You could say it's two benzene stuck together, right? There's a couple resonance structures we could draw. This is the good one where both rings both have aromatic character. We could draw another resonance structure here of naphthalene where that's not the case. And this does change the bond lengths a little bit of of naphthalene, longer and shorter. I'm not gonna get into that detail. They're not all identical in all the organic compounds. And that has to do with the different resonance structures and we'll need to get into that. But either way, you see all around the periphery here is what, 10 electrons, still aromatic. Uh, around here, six electrons each one and total of 10. So definitely naphthalene is aromatic. What about this guy? Okay. How many pi electrons? Six. Uh, is it conjugated? Yeah, it's fully conjugated. Ah, but what's the criteria here? Continuous, right? Is this conjugation continuous in the ring? No, we've got a methylene right here. So it turns out a compound like this with an exoalkene like that and saturation in the ring turns out to be non-aromatic, okay? You can double check that in the proton NMR. They resonate around five ppm, not at seven. Okay, once we get to aromaticity, then we're, we're good here. What about this compound? Now this one's kind of unique too. We're just taking this bond out of naphthalene, right? And we have a 10 membered ring here. We have uh, 10 pi electrons. It looks flat, it looks continuous. It's all in a ring. Let's see who read ahead <laughs> and why am I bringing this up? Is it aromatic or not? Somebody has an idea for us, yeah? It's not, it's not flat. Ah. 
<laughs> yeah, so someone says it's not fully flat, and that makes it pucker here, these two hydrogens here, the geometry of these alkenes. It's not a big enough ring to have it fully strain free. These two hydrogens here on these alkenes that are pointing in make it so it's not flat. Okay, which means what for the aromatic overlap in the character there? And then if you take the proton and MR of this, again, it's around five ppm, not 10. <laughs> so what do we conclude for this compound? It's called 10 aniline. <laughs> It's a higher analog of benzene. Benzene is sometimes called 6-anulene, which means six aromatic carbons all in a six-member ring. This is a 10-membered ring. I'll show you some others, 14 and 16, 18. Some of the higher analogs of benzene are known. Because it's not flat, we'd say what? Not aromatic, okay, or non-aromatic. Yeah? What's the compound in the Naphthalene. Okay, this one, I won't give you the name of that. That's a little too <laughs> complicated. How about this one, cyclopropene? <laughs> so let's see, we saw cyclobutadiene uh, last time. What do we can conclude there? It is flat, it's continuous. So criteria one is met, okay? But not criteria two, we have four electrons here. So there's no integer n that gives that. Um, it skips from two to six, right? So what do we conclude here? Because it's flat and it's continuous, it's actually anti-aromatic, okay? So that's the classic one that's known there to be anti-aromatic. Well, what about this one, cyclopropene? What would you say of that compound? Well, it's got a methylene here. It's got two pi electrons. That would be okay. It is flat, it's cyclic, but it's not continuous, right? So what do we say here, non, or not aromatic? Ah, can we make an ion that would be aromatic? Cyclopentadienyl cation is actually known. It's very stable. <laughs> and guess what, it is aromatic. How are we gonna form cyclopenta? or cyclopropene uh, neal cation. Mm, let's see, what are we gonna have to take off here? Hydride, right? And so we can use that same reagent, that triphenyl methyl cation tetrafluoroborate salt that we used before with this guy to take off this hydride that can come in there and add there. And as it comes off, look, it generates what, two pi electrons? <laughs> We have resonance here, right? We can draw the resonance structure just as a donut, and that's okay. Guess what? That's aromatic. <laughs> Take the proton and MR of that. Where does it resonate? 7 ppm. <laughs> just pretty amazing, I think. It doesn't matter the angle strain. It's a little higher energy than benzene because of angle strain. But again, the aromaticity can, uh, can help that out there. Questions on those? Okay, let's get into a couple more here. Um, which ones? How about uh, this one? This one's a little harder to draw. <laughs> Let's see if I can do it. Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. <laughs> That's a 14 aniline, it's called. Don't worry about the name of it. Um, benzene is 6 aniline, which is six pi electron. How many here? One, two, three, count them all up, 14 pi electrons. And it's a bigger ring, okay? So guess what? It can accommodate these hydrogens sticking in the middle just fine, okay? <laughs> it can get flat. 14 pi electrons, so what do you conclude already? Is it aromatic or not? Yeah, <laughs> aromatic. And uh, it is, uh, can test it by NMR, so 7 ppm in the proton NMR. So it's got that ring current, and we'll review this ring current idea. So all those electrons can go around the ring and create a electrical field there, okay? The cyclic current that creates this extra magnetic field. These on the outside here on the periphery, we say are de-shielded, okay? Which means they're shifted to a higher frequency. But what about the ones in the middle? 
we've actually got 10 hydrogens here on the periphery, but what about these four hydrogens that are in the middle? Yes, question on that? <laughs> yeah, and we'll, we'll we'll look at some bigger models. So the question is: there is there a number of carbons that once you get past, then it's not aromatic or hard to figure out? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. We're looking at smaller compounds now. I'll show you some larger ones here toward the end, though. So kind of keep that question in mind here. My question right now is: okay, these ten hydrogens on the periphery are at seven ppm, but these four in the middle are in a different position. They actually turn out uh, to be in the shielding position of the external magnetic field. So this magnetic field here is toroidal shaped. Okay, so there's directionality associated with it. And you need to draw it all the way around the ring, and we'll we'll get to that here in a second. But you see, anything in the periphery adds to the external magnetic field, which is what we look at in the NMR experiment. You see, that's in addition then. And uh, that adds to it and makes this deshielding effect at seven. But look, <laughs> the direction of the toroid, the, the extra magnetic field, actually subtracts from that. Guess where these four hydrogens resonate at? I think it's buried in one of the problems at the end of chapter 17. So, so don't worry if you don't know it right now. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Would it be like a normal alkene hydrogen around five? Or where would it be? It would be shielded, so it'd be lower than the seven, but how much lower? It's actually at zero ppm. <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> okay. And this is this anisotropy effect, and we'll have to review that here in a second. All right, um, how about this one? This is called uh, anthracene. So it's similar to naphthalene, we can say. Uh, how many pi electrons? Uh, 10. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 again, right? So is it aromatic? Yeah. Okay. So anthracene, some of these polynuclear aromatics are pretty well known also. All right. Let's get into the uh, heterocyclic compounds. How about this? Pyridine. And that's one name you need to know. Okay, it's the uh, nitrogen analog of benzene. We'll see some of these heterocycles are very common. Is it aromatic? Don't have all carbons now. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. Do we count the, the lone pair on the nitrogen? We'll have to be careful about that. In pyridine, we do not count the lone pair, okay? The lone pair is in an sp2 hybridized orbital. And we'll need to review bonding here to remind ourselves of that. Let's look at a kind of a sideways view here. Here's the nitrogen. And here's our pi electrons. And maybe we can draw them with the p atomic orbitals. Okay, and there's our overlap. So where's our lone pair? Well, it's right here. Okay, you see it's sp2. It's perpendicular to the pi system, which is top and bottom, just like benzene, okay? So the pyridine one, we just count the ones in the double bond, and we call this lone pair a pyridine-like lone pair, okay? sp2 here, lone pair. So yeah, we need to keep track of lone pairs. Someone was asking about that. Do we count lone pairs or not? <laughs> Gotta look at the structure. If it's a pyridine-like nitrogen in a ring, we don't count the lone pair as part of the aromatic grouping, okay? What if it's a parole compound? First of all, is parole aromatic? We gotta get the name up there. <laughs> parole, not pyridine, this is parole. It's a five-membered ring with a nitrogen in the ring again. Uh, what is missing here? Ah, the lone pair, I didn't draw it. But you see, parole has a hydrogen on the side, right? The nitrogen itself is still sp2 hybridized, but what's the identity of the lone pair? 
And do we count that in the aromatic grouping? First of all, let's determine, is it aromatic or not? Most people are shaking their head this way. <laughs> so we must count that, right? Yeah, six electrons, okay, aromatic, good. If we take the proton NMR, we'll see signal in the seven range. But this lone pair, what is it? It's in a what? It's in a P orbital, okay? Can you see that? Let's redraw this thing with some dimensionality to it, right? So this is different now, right? Now we're drawing parole, not pyridine. Make sure you keep these two straight. Keep this straight, you'll be okay through the rest of the examples. <laughs> pyridine lone pair is very different from a parole lone pair. Why? Here's our pi electrons, p atomic orbital. Ah, and there's the one right there, right? Yeah, so you see that's part of the aromatic hextet, we can say. We need a hextet or a decet of electrons, right? To get aromaticity, to have the, the 4n plus 2 operative. So this lone pair right here is what? In a p atomic orbital, okay? And we call that a parole type lone pair, okay? Where it counts as part of the aromatic grouping there. All right, let's do a couple other examples with the same idea. How are we doing? Yep. Okay, how about this one? Now, this is the one in histidine. This is called imidazole. Notice it's a OLE name, like parole. That tends to be the five membered ring heterocycles, OLEs. <laughs> Imidazole is in histidine, side chain of the amino acid. Is imidazole aromatic? How do we count these lone pairs? If we count both lone pairs, we get to 10 electrons. Which lone pair are we gonna count? First of all, what type of lone pair is this? That's a pyridine type lone pair, good, okay. You can kinda see that, right? The nitrogen's doubly bonded over here and there's no hydrogen there. And make sure you know you can apply your formal charge thing. These are neutral, these, these are not charged, right? We can protonate them if we have a strong enough base. We can protonate pyridine lone pairs. We'll have to get into the acid-base chemistry of that later. What about this lone pair? Do we count that one in the aromatic grouping? Yeah, because that's in a P orbital, right? That's a parole type lone pair. Okay, so how many aromatic ones continuous in the ring do we have? We have the six, okay? Six pi electrons. So it is aromatic, okay? We can draw a sideways view of it if you'd like. What would it look like? Look like this, right? See, there's that lone pair. Here's our double bond here, double bond there, and then all delocalized there. You see that hydrogen, right? It's a parole type hydrogen. That's in an sp2 orbital, right? Whereas this right here is the p orbital, the parole type orbital there, and the other one perpendicular to it. All right, how about this one? How about a purine? So this is in DNA and RNA. This is the core structure of adenosine and guanine. You've probably heard of before. And is this purine, again, adenosine, guanine, if you wanna look up those structures again. We've got four nitrogens in a bicyclic structure. Is it aromatic? <laughs> Let's see, we've got lone pairs all over the place, right? I think those ones I just did are pyridine type lone pairs, right? We've got one that's a, what, a parole type lone pair right there. Okay, that one, okay. So we don't count the pyridyl lone pairs, right? So we just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Ah, nine, ten. We count the parole. The ten E's, right? So if you keep that straight, 
puritine versus parole lone pairs, then I think you can make a pretty good assessment. Is purine aromatic? Yes. Okay. It's flat, continuous, it has the right number of 10 uh, pi electrons there. Questions on any of those? All right, if you can handle those. Let's do ones that might be a little trickier. Hopefully not. We got the criteria up there, so it's not too bad. Well, let's see, how about this one? <laughs> this is a py pyran uh, type cation. So we got what, six pi electrons. We still have a lone pair here. Do we count that lone pair on that oxygen? No, it's again sp2 hybridized. You could say, well, there's a lone pair on this oxygen here. We could draw a resonance structure of this. <laughs> and this is an important thing to point out, uh, resonance structures, right? Because if we draw the cation like this, you might say, well, do we count both of these then? Well, we've got to look at the structure, right? But if we put that pair of electrons here, you see, and, and besides, if this is a P atomic orbital here for the cation, carbocation, that's fine. We go over to the oxygen cation, that's fine too. They're both aromatic, I'd say. We just got to be careful about counting the lone pair. One's in a sp2 orbital, and one is in a p orbital, okay? So yeah, aromatic. Uh, what about this one? This is a pyridone compound, pyridine with a ketone in the ring. Aromatic or not? You could say, well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> Do we count this lone pair, this pair of electrons here in the pipe? That's not, this is exo to the ring. Remember, we need the uh, aromatic grouping, the 4n plus 2 pi electrons in the ring. But we can see this a little more clearly if we consider a resonance structure here, right? And the important resonance structure would be pushing those electrons up to oxygen, right? Now, yeah, it's a little more clear. <laughs> what type of nitrogen is this? It's a parole type nitrogen, right? So this lone pair is in a p atomic orbital. Ah, how many do we have now? One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> you see them a little more clearly there, okay? Or we could draw the rest of the structure like this. So the key is if you can see a significant important resonance structure that's aromatic, even though the first structure you might draw doesn't look aromatic, if you're gonna draw an important resonance structure that has the 4n plus two pi electrons, it will be aromatic, okay? So this compound here, here you clearly see it. You see the pyridine ring, right? And that's important because it's oxygen minus, right? The more electronegative one having the negative charge, that's fine. Even though this one here may not look like, always a ketone, you should always consider this resonance form, right? So here then at that point, you see with the lone pair, yeah, and these hydrogens on the side do resonate upfield. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are degrees to aromaticity. So someone asked, you know, is it more aromatic or, or not? Yes, so there are degrees to aromaticity. We're not going to get into that in this class. We're just going to say, is the Huckel rule satisfied? Is it flat, continuous? Yeah, then we're good. There are ways to determine the degree of aromaticity and the, the amount of stability, but we'll not, we're not gonna worry about that, is that okay? Uh, let's see, oh, this one, this is a great one. <laughs> this is azulene, <laughs> a great common name. Azul, anybody know what uh, color this might be then? Uh, blue, <laughs> azulene, don't worry about the name there. Uh, this compound turns out to be quite polar, which is an amazing thing because benzene is not polar at all. It's a nonpolar compound. It doesn't dissolve in polar solvents, whereas azulene here does dissolve 
in more polar solvents. And it does have a dipole moment to it. Ah, how do we figure that out? Well, it's bicyclic. You can count the uh, pi electrons. Yeah, there's uh, 10 of them. It is aromatic. Let's consider some resonance structures of azulene that might have charge separation. And we'll look at the individual rings and then talk about that maybe. Let's push the electrons here, here, and let's leave a pair of electrons right there on that carbon. See if you can draw the resulting resonance structure of that. Well, let's see. So seven-membered ring. That's often the hard part, just getting the seven-membered ring drawn here. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. And let's see over here. And that's over there now. Ah, that's negatively charged. Do we still have all the electrons? I didn't lose any electrons. Remember, resonance structures, you never take away or put on more electrons. You don't move atoms. We just move the electrons. So we've got a plus charge here now, and we've got a negative charge there now. Which end of azulene do you think is the positively charged end of this polar molecule? And which side is the negative and why? The positive side, yeah, is over here. <laughs> okay. And why is that? Well, if you consider this the resonance structure, and then you can just consider the donut structure, right? You can just say, well, it has two uh, aromatic rings as part of its structure. Here's what cyclopentadienyl anion, right? That we just talked about. And here on this side, what do we have? We have that uh, tropilium cation that we talked about from cyclohepta triene. And if you see the two ends here, and we can draw other resonance structures here. The positive charge can be here or over here or even there going around the ring. Okay. And this negative charge can be here or over here. Okay. But it helps to polarize the electrons this way. And you see the full blown charges now on these individual resonance structures. And the individual ones looking at the individual rings are aromatic. Okay. And that's another hallmark of, yeah, I'm using resonance structures correctly, you know, pushing the electrons in the right way to give both of these rings aromatic character. And that accounts for the fact that azulene absorbs in the visible range, and that's a blue color. <laughs> it's highly uh, conjugated. Those electrons have a smaller homolumo gap, and plus it can dissolve in more polar solvents which is kind of an amazing thing that's explained using aromatic theory, which is kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah, you could push them the other way, right? And then you get these individual rings over here uh, would be anti-aromatic, okay? So if you have the cation here over in the five-membered ring, that would be, that, that sub-ring would be anti-aromatic. And then if you push the anion over here to the seven member ring, the anion. you can experiment with that. Try some other resonance structures. Let me just look through here and see if there's a couple others. No, I think that's, that's most of them we wanted to cover. Yeah, let me look at your homework. Oh, okay. Yeah, how about this one? <laughs> let me help you out here. How about this compound? Cyclo... Pentadiene own, that's called. Look at that compound. It looks pretty innocent, doesn't it? Look at your ketone, a couple alkenes. It's a five member ring, not strained. If you go to the Aldrich catalog or any chemical supplier and try to order that compound, guess what? Can you find it? It turns out that compound is not known. <laughs> it's a theoretical compound very high energy, and so far it hasn't been made. Why? Well, <laughs> let's consider something here. What would happen if we consider the major resonance structure of this? Push the electrons up on the oxygen. That's where they'd want to be, right? Uh-oh. Do you see a problem now associated with that? What's wrong here? In the major resonance structure, you've got an anti-aromatic structure. <laughs> and that will make that very high energy. Okay, it's not just the 30 kcals per mole it loses. 
it actually, because it's flat, it'll force that to be very high in energy and very difficult to make. There have been some other compounds made, like the, uh, the tetraphenyl uh, version has been made, and that helps stabilize this to some extent with the extra resonance. But the individual simple compound turns out to be anti aromatic and very, very problematic. So consider the resonance structures and that'll often be helpful. Let's see, Tyler, let's go up to the board there and uh, look at a couple other things here. So there's our ring current idea, proton NMR, uh, seven to eight PPM. For anything on the periphery that's uh, de-shielded, shifted further uh, down field, okay. And that's because of this induced ring current. You can say the pi electrons, if it's aromatic, two, four, two, six, ten, whatever, uh, aromatic grouping, these are fully delocalized and they create a ring current. I guess they are moving around the ring. That's okay to think of them that way. That creates an electric field here, this blue, these blue lines here. And then perpendicular to that is what? The magnetic field. That's your basic physics, right? Electrical fields and magnetic fields are always mutually perpendicular to each other. They go along. That's why you call it electromagnetic radiation after all. Okay, even a single uh, photon propagating in space has that thing to it. But we call this anisotropy because in the localized field here, different nuclei can experience different uh, effects. So anything over the top or underneath an aromatic ring will actually be what? Shielded. And that was that, that 14 annuline compound we showed you. The protons in the middle were shielded around a zero ppm. Okay, it's gonna be a strong shielding position. Anything on the periphery though is de-shielded down to seven. Okay, so make sure you review that a little bit. Okay, uh, benzopyrene. Here's another aromatic compound, polynuclear aromatic. A lot of benzenes fused together. This comes out of tobacco smoke, soot comes out of anything organic that's on fire, by the way, any plant material, burning it, whatever. It's a little piece of charcoal, if you will, okay? That's why it's not good to inhale a fire. Don't put your face over a campfire and try to inhale, okay? Maybe as scouts, you tried that and it wasn't a good experience. <laughs> you won't last too long. The problem is you ingest too much of this material and then the liver, it gets oxidized, gets metabolized to this epoxide first gets opened up to this dial, and then this ring on the end gets epoxidized again. Epoxides are electrophilic. They undergo nucleophilic attack, right? If enough of this builds up in the cell, DNA, the N7 amino group on guanine, is nucleophilic enough to add to that epoxide and form a covalent adduct. So here's a little piece of DNA with guanine alkylated with that epoxide. Well, what does that do to the DNA? When it replicates, it causes a frame shift. And if that frame shift occurs within a gene called P53, which functions as a tumor suppressor protein, it gets mutated. And if there are three mutations, and here are the three key ones that are known, okay, <laughs> you develop uh, the mutated form of P53, which loses the ability to bind to DNA and to keep it from replicating in an uncontrolled manner. If DNA is replicating in an uncontrolled manner and cell division is going on without control, what do we call that disease? Cancer, okay? So lung cancer is the most well-established molecular pathway for how cancers develop. Most, a lot of cancers are just spontaneous mutations. Well, this is a specific one. Most DNA alkylations will, will lead to cell death, but if it occurs in three hotspot regions, it's said, It'll lead to these uh, immortal cells that'll just keep dividing, okay? And that can lead to tumors and whatever. But it's this electrophilic epoxide and this aromatic thing. And you can also see some aromatic pi stacking, we call, between the aromatic base pairs here in DNA, which allows this uh, pyrene thing to intercalate, it's called, to bind into DNA and then cause that... Uh, that problem. So know something about the basics of that. These applications don't memorize everything about it. Okay, <laughs> This is not a toxicology class or a cancer class, but you can see this aromatic compound, okay, interacting with DNA can lead to this, these mutations that can be a, a, a cancer state. Okay, so back to uh, benzene. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, you know, fully delocalized, great. So we, 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 we get that. But what are the molecular orbitals? Now, at the beginning of class last time, remember, we looked at the six molecular orbitals because we have six pi atomic orbitals, right? P atomic, we need six MOs. And it's a cyclic thing. So how we can do the nodes depends on how it goes. And you can see the molecular orbitals. There's a low one, and then there's two here that are filled here, two higher, and then one very high. Now, if we draw lines here between these molecular orbitals, look, we inscribe a polygon. We inscribe the hexagon. You can see the approximation of the shape of benzene here with the energy levels of the molecular orbitals. And they're all, fill, they're all filled here below this halfway point. And here is our 4n plus 2 rule. Here's the plus 2, and here's the 4. Okay? So Frost noticed this. You can inscribe a polygon, an array of whatever cyclic structure you're looking at, and then analyze how many electrons are filling the filled level here. And you can say if you fully fill those orbitals below the halfway point, you have an aromatic compound. Okay, here's the six pi electrons. If we had two more over here, if it was a bigger polygon, we'd have what? The 10 electrons. <laughs> so let's see how this works. Well, here's the MOs from benzene we saw before. Here's the low energy one, all in phase. Here's the next one up where we've got, what, a node uh, right here, okay? <laughs> and then a node through the bonds there. Those, those each have one node, so those are the two homos. Then we have two lumos, which have two nodes, and then the highest one has the three nodes. But again, they approximate the positions of the polygon, okay? According to Frost, anyway. And here is Frost, here's his story. And this is pictorial, you know, it's qualitative, and that's great. You don't want to see the quantum mechanics after all. Or maybe some of you will see that later on in advanced classes. So here's benzene, right? Here's the uh, polygon. And you have to inscribe it with a vertex down right here. And then the halfway point, if it's all filled below there, paired up electrons, we say it's aromatic. Or here's cyclopen uh, uh, cyclopropenyl cation, right? Put the polygon on its vertex there. And here's the position of the molecular orbitals. We don't have to draw them out. We could, but there they are. Two go in the low energy point, and that's below this halfway point, the green line there. Here's cyclobutadiene. Put it on its corner there. Here's the approximation of the MOs. There's four of them. And look, we have half filled right at the line there. According to Frost, we say that half filled at the line, at the halfway point, that's anti-aromatic. Okay, we're not fully filling below that line. And then we have cyclopentadienyl uh, anion. And here we have the inscribed polygon on its vertex. And there's the approximation of the polygon in the corners. And the two there are below the green line. And they're filled. So we say, yeah, that anion is, an, is aromatic, right? And same thing here with tropilium cation. You can go through that and see you're filled the six pi electrons below, and there's your inscribed uh, uh, heptagon, right? It's a seven member. <laughs> anyway, what does this remind you of? This is kind of craziness, isn't it? Kind of the symbolism thing going on here. Symbols are important in science. How about this? Anybody seen this before? <laughs> Speaking of symbols, who is this, by the way? David O. McKay, prophet of the church in the 50s and 60s. When he was on his mission in Scotland, he found a stone that had this inscription on it. <laughs> I like it because it's what? Cyclic uh, organic compounds. And it has cyclohexane right in the middle, or benzene if you do the earring. Uh, why is this called a magic stone? Each direction here, in any direction, uh, three counting three across or three diagonally either way, add up to what? 18. <laughs> so here's some symbolism. You know, I'm not sure if this guy was a uh, 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 meaning to ascribe any uh, magic symbolism to this thing, but this architect put his name on there. Uh, the stone currently is found where? David O. McKay asked if he could have this stone. They were remodeling a building. They actually took the stone off the building. So David O. McKay said, yeah, could I have that stone? They said, sure. Where is it now? MTC, right? <laughs> You've seen it in the lobby, right? Yeah, it's still there, I think. But it's kind of cool there. Uh, you also have the two-membered ring here. This is ethylene, right? <laughs> That's for two. 
two, six, and then 10 here. We got the Roman symbol for cyclodecane, and that adds up to 18, and 18 any which way, okay, using the <laughs> cyclic structures. Anyway, okay, back to reality, back to some bigger ones. Some people have asked about bigger aromatic compounds. Well, this was an unusual thing about uh, 30 years ago. Croto and Smalley won the Nobel Prize for this. They were looking at graphite and treating it in electric arc, okay? Uh, arc welder, very high energy spark, right? They're passing the graphite through there and collecting some compounds. And this is the GC mass spec. They got this big peak right here that in the mass spec had a mass of 720. 720 molecular weight, that's high. If you divide by 12 though, what is 720? It's 60, C60. What's the formula for this spike right here? This one right here is also pretty big. That's C70. Well, that was a head scratcher. They didn't know what they had. Why are we getting this real stable compound out of a lot of different compounds coming out of graphite when we blast it with an arc welder? <laughs> well, it took them a while. They had to go over to the math department and figure this out. It's a complex polygon, cyclic. It's called a truncated icosahedron, if you're into these type of polygons. <laughs> it's alternating uh, six and five rings. And they were still scratching their head when the mathematician told them truncated icosahedron. What does that mean? Well, that means a icosahedron with the corners snipped off to give you 12 or tw 20 faces instead of 12. Smalley said, well, I still don't get it. And the guy said, uh, Dr. Smalley, you've made a soccer ball. <laughs> oh, and then the lights went off. Okay, that, that's a soccer ball. They named it after Buckminster Fuller. That was the name of a, uh, of a person in the 60s, an architect who designed geodesic dome buildings. So this is the name of the guy, Buckminster Fuller, but that wasn't the chemist who identified these. These are fullerene compounds. There's a whole bunch of them. Here's the soccer ball one, C60. And look, there's your benzene. Is it aromatic? Oh, we need to ask that question, don't we? C60? How many pi electrons is that? Let's see, we do minus two, that would be 58. Divide by four, what would that? 58 divided by four, anybody got a calculator? I think it's 14 and a half. So is there an integer n that satisfies the four n plus two rule to get to 60? No. <laughs> so it turns out it's the wrong number of electrons. There's another problem with buckyball, which is what? Wrong number of electrons and what's the other criteria it violates? It's not flat, it's spherical. But how aromatic can you have it be? Can you, how, how much away from planarity can you still have this stabilization? This is an unstable compound. It could be made, but it reacts differently than benzene. So we say it's, it's at least not aromatic or it doesn't have super aromatic character. The localized benzenes, you could say, do have aromatic character. And they're flat enough locally to say that. But, you know, okay, so here's your icosahedron, the 12 face thing. You snip off the corners and you get the the truncated icosahedron. There are other fullerenes, 70, 32, 50, 254, and C540. <laughs> they look like chicken wire, right? <laughs> it's a whole bunch of these. And you can make tubes and shells and you can fill them with different things. So it's a whole other world of different allotropes of carbon. It's just carbon, no hydrogen there. But mechanically, these create all sorts of little structures, little nanoscale structures. So engineers are very interested in these. They have unique magnetic and electronic properties. Here's other allotropes. Here's graphite, which is, comes out of the earth. You write with your pencil lead with that stuff, right? A simple layer here of graphite is graphene. Guys won the Nobel Prize for that too recently. Here's the fullerene, the cyclic thing. And then there are the tubes, the nanotubes. So you can imagine all sorts of stuff there. Of course, the most famous allotrope of carbon is still the one that we make jewelry out of, right? Diamond. <laughs> that's the hardest one. And that's not benzene rings. This is the SP3 hybridized version of carbon, where it's all interpenetrating cyclohexanes in all dimensions, which is really cool. So all these guys are SP2 hybridized carbon in all directions. 
uh, whereas this is SP3 in all directions. And yeah, here's the warning, right? Chapter 18 coming up, electrophilic aromatic substitution. Here's the five key reactions, and we'll get into that on Wednesday. So very good. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.